but let's catch up with the ducks folks um it's kind of a windy day so i'll apologize in advance for the noise but uh everybody's happy you can see the uh the molt is almost over and you can see something really unique with cayuga ducks that duck right there that's you know salt and pepper colored she is not a uh, a breed that does that that's a cayuga that are all black when they're first born that's her third year so her second molt and the same with that one right there looking at you they basically turn white at about five years of age the cayuga will look like a great big white layer um, they'll, they'll lose almost every bit of the uh, black coloring in them. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. That guy there, that's a young uh, Swedish drake. I don't think he molted this year because he was born this year. Fox the cat's out here hanging out with us. Um, Started to notice some breeding behavior between a pair of the geese. It's a little bit early and I don't think they've quite worked it out yet and figured out how to, how to pull it off. But I definitely have at least one pair that have pretty much pair bonded at this point that leaves uh three girls up for grabs for two ganders and uh like i said geese when it's when the numbers work out that way will go to a breeding trio with one gander and two gooses so that's probably what's going to happen there um babies are progressing well uh we have one little baby that i shot a little quick video of uh yesterday i'll put up as well today um, but they're, you know, that baby's much smaller than these, these guys here. These guys now are about five weeks, six weeks old. And, uh, man, I love watching that little gray muscovy there. That duck is a hunter supreme. And you can see there's mom. They're half the size of mom already. That's actually two moms. Both of those moms were broody. Only one uh, managed to hatch any eggs, and uh, they kind of... Uh, we're brooding right next to each other, so they're co-parenting, so everybody gets their baby fix on. And uh, I think that guy right there looks to be a little Swedish, and I'm gonna bet that's a drake. Um, I've just found that most of those that hatch for us end up being drakes for some reason out of that breed. But uh, time to move the hose. And as you can see, I'll show you better here in a second once I get this hose properly installed. We're in the West Pasture. And I think it's really cool to have you over here today to show you the size of these locust trees we put in these berms. Now these were seedlings. I mean, they were 12 inch, you know, 10 to 12 inch seedlings when they went in. And most of them are over five foot tall now. And they're doing really well. And despite the irrigation, we did not irrigate very much this year um, at all. Uh, a couple times when it got really bad, this was supposed to be on automated irrigation. That'll happen this fall. I hurt myself this spring and I just didn't get around to it and uh, decided, well, let's see what the design will do, you know, with the irrigation only as an a absolute fail-safe backup. And man, these locust trees are tough. I mean, this is a tough environment. You guys know there's about four inches of soil before you hit rock there. We built that berm up about 10 inches, 12 inches in the center with compost. That's still not a lot for a tree to get started, you know, in this environment. We did lose a lot of the plants. I had a bunch of really cheap uh, elderberries and bush cherries, but a lot of them made it too. And elderberries, a lot of times you'll think you lost your elderberries in the spring. They just come raging up from the roots. So we'll see there. And this is the big surprise. Um, I'm on my way here to a land race of uh, basil. The, the basil has just exploded this year, and uh, I'll save a ton of this seed and re-sow it next year, and uh, we'll have our own regionally adapted. This is, the, this is actually the third time this seed's been sown, but it's never done so good, especially when you look where it is. I mean, a lot of this isn't in the berms. Look, these plants here are growing in this native soil. This whole place has really changed. I just mowed it in preparation for bringing the the ducks over the first time this year it was weeds and it was waist high and it was a it was a hard job to mow especially the way this is configured but i wanted to give it a full season of absolutely just leaving it alone and I, the ducks haven't been here since the spring and look at the basil i mean it looks like a basil farm and i'll tell you what's really awesome about it it's all going to flower now my bees are killing it i don't know what basil flavored uh, basil blossom honey is like but I'm gonna find out. Yeah, the bees have returned. I can't take you down to see them. The pond's down there. You can kind of see where it is. We 
we've got this cross fence to keep those ducks out of the pond. This is uh, a red mulberry that was planted as a small seedling this year. And I guess that's the power of duck poop water, man. That tree, look at the stock on that thing. So this is Morris Aruba, which should produce a really great mast of uh, uh, mulberries. I'm sure that, that, that pool's overflowing, but I gotta show you something else here. So these bush mulberries I've been growing, man, talk about tough. This hasn't been irrigated at all this year. This was a little cutting that I put in of two years ago and trained it up against this fence. Look at this. We got second crop of mulberries coming on this year. I don't know if I'm gonna get enough for another batch of mead, but I'm gonna try. Anyway, that's gonna be my breakfast. I'll catch up with you guys later. Look at that, guys. Foxy Fox the cat. I'm telling you, this cat acts more like a dog than a cat. Follows me all around in the morning and hangs out. Say goodbye, Fox.